thanks for joining. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, me and Soumya are here to present about the topic display sharing in heterogeneous systems uh, using Linux. So, we both are from TI. At TI, we have strong commitment to open source and an upstream first approach. Uh, so, we both work at uh, Texas Instruments as uh, embedded developer. Uh, and uh, so, this is the outline of our presentation. Uh, so, we'll go through introduction like what we mean by display sharing, what are different practical applications of display sharing, and what are the design considerations or and what different sub problems we need to uh, solve to achieve uh, this uh, functionality. Then we'll go through different uh, approaches uh, to solve this problem. Uh, and uh, like some of the approaches are already there in uh, some vendor specific uh, repositories and some uh, we are working on it. So we'll go through different possible approaches. Then we'll show a demo of uh, what we have done for this uh, in our hardware. And then we'll stop for the question and answers. So what is display sharing? So nowadays uh, in system on chips, uh, we have heterogeneous systems where there are multiple processing cores and uh, you may want to control the same display controller uh, from different processing entities because uh, you have like one display controller and uh, more than one processing cores like you can have an application or an ARM core and uh, uh, MCU core and you may want to access uh, the display controller sim simultaneously from both the cores. And uh, for example, in this diagram, I'm showing that uh, there is an MPU uh, and we want to, which wants to render a, uh, the graphics using the GPU and it wants to control the display controller. And you also have another uh, microcontroller uh, which wants to uh, display the safety context uh, using the same display controller and uh, feed it to the same display. So uh, why, why is this required? Like why, why not have only one core uh, control both uh, the graphics and safety or any, uh, all the feeds? Uh, why not one core, uh, we allow one, only one core to that, right? So this required because RTOS have their unique, own unique capability. Like RTOS control displays are fast and uh, they are able to render uh, low latency graphics uh, uh, in real time and uh, RTOS mostly lack the capability of GPU programming so you cannot use uh, or you cannot leverage GPU to render the graphics and similarly the MPUs or the application processors in Linux we have uh, GPU drivers already available so we can use uh, those uh, application processors to render the uh, G GPU uh, rendered uh, graphics. And one more reason is like you, you want to isolate the display, right? For example, you have the safety context. Uh, by safety context, I mean like uh, any critical uh, display information that, for example, you have safety telltales in your automotive or any critical parameters. So you, you don't want to uh, get that display context corrupted by the uh, core which is running high level OS. So for example, your Linux or any other operating system which is rendering the graphics, it suddenly crashes. We don't want to impact the safety context uh, that is rendered by the MCU. So there are different uh, practical applications to it. Uh, for example, there is an automotive use case. Uh, in this, I'm showing there is an IVI which uh, needs to be uh, rendered from the application core. And similarly, in display cluster, uh, you, you will have like uh, part of the display uh, which is GPU rendered and the other part like safety telltales and critical signs uh, rendered from uh, the RTOS. And similarly in industrial HMI, uh, there are critical uh, machine statistics, statistics or any environment, environmental uh, uh, parameters, you may want to render it from the safety context using RTOS and uh, the other part of the application, uh, you may want to GPU render it. Similarly, for the medical instruments, uh, you may want to show critical or vital health parameters using the RTOS and uh, the rest of the GUI, you may want to again use GPU to render that. And there is a possibility also that uh, there could be multiple display panels uh, getting used uh, in your use case like IVI plus display cluster 
and you have only single display controller. So uh, these are the different applications where uh, the display sharing uh, will be useful. So okay, uh, we want to achieve the display sharing then uh, what problems we want to solve, right? So right now if we look at the architecture, let's say uh, you have Linux, you will have a DRM KMS compliant driver uh, that is present. So it will try to take full control of the display controller, it doesn't know about sharing. So uh, it, it, you cannot uh, partition the resources directly using your DRM KMS driver. Similarly, your existing RTOS application, it will also try to take uh, full control of the display. So uh, both are in their own uh, world, so they don't know about display sharing, right? So uh, we want to define some handshake mechanism or some partitioning, uh, partitioning uh, way to uh, define this display sharing. And it's a generic problem. Right now, each vendors, uh, they have their own solutions and they all are solving the same problem in different ways. So if you have to achieve this uh, uh, use case, there are different uh, sub problems that we, we need to solve. Like we need to define like who, which core will initialize the display first and how this uh, information will be shared to the other core that the display is initialized. Then we will have to uh, define some mechanism to partition the display resources like which part of the display controller or which display resources will be owned by which core. And uh, all this we have to do uh, and we have to make sure that there is no change to existing uh, display windowing mechanisms uh, or uh, display servers. Like you don't want to change Western to achieve this use case, right? Your, all your existing display application uh, should still work seamless, seamlessly. Also, if you have like some specific uh, so part of the solution may depend on your display controller also, like if you have some specific features in your display controller, then you may want to uh, design the solution accordingly. So we explored different uh, approaches to solve this uh, problem. So there were like two classes uh, of these approaches. Uh, one was the IPC based. Uh, by IPC, I mean the interprocessor communication uh, between the two cores. And the other was uh, non-IPC based that uh, we did uh, to achieve this. So uh, both of these solutions, like there is an RP message K drive, uh, it's hyperlinked. So uh, this we did at TI uh, some years back and this not in upstream. And we also referred one uh, solution for RPI, which was exactly not display sharing, but it could have still been, uh, we could have still leveraged it for display sharing. So for the non-IPC based uh, solution, we have posted an RFC and uh, I think it's going in the right direction. So what is the base design of the IPC uh, based uh, display sharing, right? So you have a display controller, it will have its own power domain or own clock domain and the register space. So in this design, we are giving authority to only one processing core to control power domain, clock domain and the register space. The other core won't have direct access to all uh, to this display controller at all. The core which is controlling, uh, having the control of this uh, power domains and the register space uh, will act as a display server. And the other core uh, which wants to uh, uh, leverage or use this display controller uh, uh, then it will need uh, to act as a client and request specific resources from this server using IPC mechanism. So what all handshakes are required between the client and server uh, to achieve uh, this display sharing, right? So the display client will need to know from the display server like when uh, the display server has already initialized it. So we need a handshake for a display ready message. Then the client will also need to know what is the resolution or the mode that is set by the display server. Client will also need to know uh, what are different resolutions supported uh, by the display. And uh, we also need a mechanism for the client to submit the frame buffer information to the server. And we also need mechanism to tell the client that frame done has happened or a vsync has happened. 
So there either needs to be an interrupt forwarding or HR timer based polling or uh, dedicated IRQs. So all this we require because client, uh, we have isolated the client completely uh, from accessing the display controller resources directly. All this uh, information it needs to get from the IPC mechanism. So first solution that we did some years back uh, was uh, that we introduced a new bus called RP message K drive. So it was a device uh, virtualization framework uh, which provided uh, different base APIs uh, like how uh, the uh, driver can uh, request uh, different uh, information and resources uh, from the server and how it can receive the responses back. And on top of this uh, RP message K drive bus, uh, we added another uh, driver uh, that is the uh, remote device virtual display driver, which provided additional APIs to get display specific uh, information from the server. And uh, we use the RP message mechanism to uh, talk to the RTOS firmware, and uh, underneath we use the mailbox uh, to, noti uh, to notify uh, the message uh, transfer. And in the DRM KMS driver, we updated it to use these APIs uh, to translate the upper level DRM KMS calls uh, to this RP message uh, APIs. And we use added virtual encoder and virtual connector to enumerate uh, the, uh, this DRM components. So uh, for this IPC mechanism, as I said, right, uh, the client will need to know the when is the display ready. So we added the ready uh, callback in the probe and we would defer the probe until the uh, display server tells that it has initialized the display. Uh, then in the mode set function, we are asking the remote core to get all the supported resolutions and we are registering some callbacks uh, which will get triggered when the remote core tells that the frame done has happened. Then for committing the frame buffer, we are calling the commit API uh, from the uh, RP message KDrive display driver. And uh, when the uh, remote uh, remote server has completed the frame done, uh, this uh, commit done callback will get triggered and uh, we'll get to know that the frame done has done. So we'll uh, issue the vblank IRQ in the host. So all these uh, callbacks that I showed in the previous slide, like ready, get res, info, commit, we'll see how they are getting translated to the RP message. So all these are like uh, in the ready callback, we are calling this API and we are sending an RP message uh, using this message type. And for the getting the resolution, we have another message type, which again we are sending using the RP message KDRA. And uh, for, for the commit, uh, we have this uh, display commit function uh, where again we are using the RP message key drive to send the request and get the response back. And uh, for, for the commit done, uh, as I shared, shared in the previous uh, slide, we are triggering the commit done uh, callback uh, from which we are uh, uh, sharing the vsync done info to the client. Then we also explored the Raspberry Pi solution uh, to this. So Raspberry Pi had a fake KMS uh, driver, uh, firmware KMS driver, and their design was the firmware was in control of the display. So uh, they were translating the DRM KMS calls uh, to the uh, RPI FKMS uh, uh, messages and controlling the display. So uh, their, their architecture was like DRM KMS driver was there and they were calling the mailbox APIs using, under, using the underlying mailbox driver and they were like separate tags for each functionality and they were sending the mailbox uh, to uh, pass on the request from the uh, client to the server and they were using a dedicated IRQs for this. So again, uh, for powering up the display, uh, they had a separate uh, mailbox tag, which they were triggering using this API. Uh, for getting the display config, uh, they had a get display config tag. And for submitting the frame buffer or setting the plane, uh, they had a structure which uh, they were filling with this set plane tag and similar structure uh, they had on the firmware side. Uh, and uh, once they receive this 32-bit message, uh, they, uh, the same structure they, they were enumerating there uh, by uh, 
pass, uh, by getting the address of uh, this structure from the mailbox. And for setting the display mode, uh, they had this set timing uh, tag uh, where they were enumerating all the uh, requested mode information uh, from the DRM KMS and sending it to the uh, re remote uh, remote processor using the mailbox. So both of these uh, were uh, not upstream. So we were just thinking about like if we have to expand on uh, these approaches or uh, like what are the pros and cons of uh, these approaches, right? So uh, the first one that RP message uh, K drive uh, it in, it had introduced a new bus called RP message K drive. So we had thought at that time if there are more than one uh, uh, sharing mechanisms like display network or other drivers which have similar problem of sharing the resources between two cores, then it might be useful. But another approach could have been like if you don't want to add a new bus like RP message uh, K drive and instead of it if you directly want to uh, have a driver like RP message uh, KMS driver uh, the, similar to RP message TTY then that could also have been one approach because it's simple it's similar to uh, RP message care or RP message TTY driver where we uh, just directly leverage the Vertio RP message framework. Another uh, thought we had like if we have to share some common ground uh, between the uh, display virtualization and display sharing use case, uh, then uh, we could have directly used the Vertio KMS uh, approach where Vertio KMS driver would sit directly on top of Vertio bus and uh, it, it would share uh, common ground with display virtualization also, display virtualization use case can also leverage this and a similar thing is already done Vertio GPU and uh, I had seen this Vertio console driver where they had also added a remote device support to it so they were using the Vertio console for both virtualization use cases and uh, remote, uh, re remote sharing use cases. Now I'll hand over to my colleague Soumya who would walk over through the static design. Hello everyone. I guess I'm a module. Yes. So, so let's see what is non-IPC based static partitioning. So what do you mean by static partitioning of display resources? Say for if each host that is present in your system can be compiled to support display resources that is controlled by it. But, but if you see, we do require some kind of hardware assistance. Say for in a display controller, you have for each of the components that are present in your display controller has separate register space, separate IRQ lines that each host can subscribe to, then independently you control the display resources that are present in your display controller. There are various use cases associated with this also. Say for example, in your system, uh, any host that boots early, okay, and has configured the global configuration for your DSS, then how does the any other host that boots up late in your system is using the same initialized state as it is. So let's understand the static partitioning by taking an example. So what do I have here is uh, the TI display subsystem. So if you see there are multiple components inside this TI display subsystem. We, it's a multi-pipeline display controller. We have something called video pipeline here. There is a video light pipeline, then there are overlay managers, video ports and all. So if you consider this video pipeline, it's nothing but a component that takes a frame input, does some processing. So you can map it to DRM planes. Similarly, there are overlay managers. This overlay managers is nothing but takes multiple planes as input, and then based on your selection, like single plane or dual plane, overlays together and gives a final output frame. So, and also the video port. The video port is nothing but timing generator part that generates the timing signals to control your display. So all together they make up to DRM CRTCs. Apart from this, there is panel where you see the output. So we, it maps to the DRM plane. So all together, if you see this TI display subsystem has some unique features with respect to, it has multi, each of these components has a specific register space so that each host can subscribe to. Apart from that, all these components that are present in the display controller has IRQs 
these IRQs are all together what you say mapped together to sub, uh, do duplication and you have two different spaces called uh, common region spaces where all these IRQ statuses and registers can be read to and uh, each component uh, whatever these components are that video pipeline and all they provide the IRQs and there is duplication so any of the host can subscribe to these uh, separately and have independent control so <clears throat> as I said like so why these IRQs are necessary to be known because we need to know that each of the hosts that controls the display resources needs to know like the B blank imports, when has been the frame done and all. So you, if you have an isolation already present like separate spaces, register spaces, then each of these hosts can subscribe into. Let's understand it more by taking a use case. So for example, uh, yeah, there are two hosts in your system that is Artos and Linux and they subscribe to separate IRQ lines. And the, and the, the blue things that you see here so you Artos is controlling one of the DRM plane, the DRM CRTC and complete towards the panel. And Linux is actually having only one control of DRM plane. Then how do we tell that, okay, Linux does not interrupt the context of Artos or does not go and override the register spaces that Artos did write? So we have something called firewalling. So we firewall those register spaces that Linux uh, can corrupt or go override it. So this way we do protect anything that is being, what do you say, written by Artos early in the system and can be overwritten by Linux later. So also with this, even though when you do firewalling, then you provide read accesses. So why do we provide this read access? There's a benefit towards it, which we'll go understand later. Let's see how how we do this starting partitioning in device tree. So we define two attributes, something called exclusive ownership attribute and shared mode attribute. So this exclusive ownership attribute is nothing but any display resource that is, or what do you say, owned by a uh, host has right access to it. So it has exclusive ownership. And there is something called shared mode attribute, which, which we, any resources, display resources that are present in your system can be shared with any other host or entity. So how do we relate these things to the different uh, register regions that we have in our TI display subsystem? So as I said earlier, the display controller of TI has some unique features with respect to uh, different IRQ lines that are duplicated where each host can subscribe into. And uh, that is a global configuration register that is also duplicated where each host subscribes into and looks for the uh, IRQ statuses, the V-blank interrupts and all. So any host, say for example, who comes up early in the system and does the global configuration can take the exclusive ownership of this common region. Similarly for the video pipeline, so in any of the use cases, you at least require a plane to be controlled by any of the host. So you can take exclusive ownership of this region also. Similarly for the other two, there will be use cases where you will have like, okay, there are uh, multiple planes being controlled by different hosts, but at the end, the overlay manager overlays all together. So you can have a shared mode attribute or a full complete ownership to it. But there is one-to-one -one mapping between the, via the video port and the overlay manager. So you, have, you either have a shared mode or a full exclusive ownership based on the use case that you have. With respect to how we define this thing in device tree is we have some device tree bindings. So there is something called DSS shared mode where we uh, say that, okay, you have to enable display sharing mode and which are the planes in control that is owned by the Linux and which are the video ports that are being used for these video planes. And in case of any use case where there is a complete ownership of the video port also, the final output then we have DSS shared mode own VP. And especially I said like when you have to have independent control of the display resources, you need to know the VPLANK interrupts and all. So there is this common region which Linux can subscribe into. So there are duplicate regions which Linux can subscribe into and know when frame done has happened. So 
let's let's understand this with an use case a typical use case this is so you have a automotive display cluster use case where say for example one of the plane is being controlled by linux and rest of the uh, drm plane the crtc everything is done by artos so how do you say that in the device tree so we do have here a device tree snippet where you say say for example which of the video plane that the uh, the uh, linux owns what's the z order of that plane and what is the vp that is being shared does it own any vp or not and all once you have all this thing defined in the device tree how do you translate these things into your driver so in ti dss driver we have a global display structure that says about all the display resources that you have in the display controller so there is a function that updates the uh, this display resources structure it parses the device tree and then updates the whole uh, resources uh, table with respect to the shared mode or exclusive mode ownership <coughs> another example if you see we have a uh, full pipeline being owned by linux so this can be an use case where you have uh, two display outputs one output with completely controlled by the artos and is displaying something and another is like linux is displaying something then you have full ownership of the video port the video pipe planes and all the things so you define it like okay i have in the device tree that what's the z order of it what's the plane it's being using and is that is a owned vp or not and you can achieve uh, different partitioning or tailoring schemes that you can have with this device tree approach next is the firewalling scheme so why why is is this necessary so for example in a uh, in a system where your artos is booting early and it has configured uh, uh, some of the display parameters like the screen size the width of the panel and all and linux needs to just use one plane and give the output so if you firewall it and then provide the read access so linux can just read the registers and know okay what is the screen size the width and all <coughs> it is also necessary that okay uh, uh, well, there is there are some use cases in with respect to automotive where you want that okay whatever the resources that are owned by the ados domain are running in a safety context so you require full isolation so firewalling comes to play in that picture <coughs> next is why we took static partitioning so we are trying to leverage the hardware features it supports ro uh, robust partitioning of display resources so there is no interference between each other contexts are uh, protected from each other allows parallel and independent control of display resources and we have duplicated interrupts for each uh, host so each host can subscribe to any of the rq lines and know the v blank interrupts also there is no processing overload for because of ipc or processor context switch and overall you have a faster software development cycle so here we have a demo that uh, shows how what do you say crashing any high level os like linux does not alter the context of display that is being done by artos so if you see the tail tails here are being done by artos and this is being done, uh, rendered using gpu by linux i just crashed the linux here using sysrq and if you see the tail tails are still rendering but the high level graphics stopped <sighs> we do have a demo at booth edp3 please come join us to know more about it here are the references that we have and we took to have this presentation thanks to texas instruments and linux foundation for giving us the opportunities to speak here and we are open for q and a hello thank you for the talk how much of this work and especially the device rebinding has been accepted upstream uh it's it's posted uh, it's in rfc some comments were there like he didn't want to have the share ds a shared mode uh, attribute so some changes are there and we'll work on that uh, and post another 
version of the patch, but it's mostly aligned to what, what I saw in the responses. All right. And um, so if I understood well, your use case is sharing the display between two CPU cores. Have you had also considered the use case where you need to share the display between the normal world and the secure world? In the case where you have one core and you need to run some secure payload that needs to access the display and also the normal world? Or is this out not, not the use case anymore? Yeah, that's, that's the use case. So, so basically, uh, the, uh, the customers do require something like uh, in case of automotive display cluster, so each of the frames that is coming from MCU requires safety monitoring. Like, so you have freeze framing or the data integrity check of each of the frame. So that that can be also done, and the MCU renders those frames and it has to check those things. So there is a complete isolation. And if if high level OS crashes or something and doesn't, uh, what do you say, uh, it freezes or something, then still the safety context core. yeah but this again this is with two cores right an mcu core and an mpu core i was yeah. referring to you have a single core like cortex a and you have normal world and secure world on the same core right? like oh, yeah exactly linux plus opti or something like that running on the same core just wondering if it was also covered in, in your yeah. work or not so no i don't think we are okay. no. targeting that one So uh, related to that security question, if uh, if the Linux core is like trying to get past the firewall uh, to overwrite something else, how uh, how do, I believe I talked with you guys at the booth and you said you actually have hardware to to deal with this, but uh, it. it can you speak more of how it's firewalled? Uh, does it only give a time slot to, to write just the right amount of memory? Or uh, c could I pass a, something and overwrite my buffer and display? It's secure in, in an area. That, like, could I, could I pass a false message to the user? Uh, so, so with respect to firewalling, so basically all these, uh, any of the display resources, say for example, these pipelines or anything has a register space, right? So we do some kind of uh, firewalling with respect to foreground and background firewalling that we do at uh, NTI parts. So you have a common region that you allow some core to have access to. And then on top of that, you give uh, foreground layers that which other cores cannot have access specific to it. So if you have that, then there is a special security manager that gets exceptions, and you cannot write it at all. You cannot access it. It keeps on having exceptions. Yeah, so if you look at the display controller we have, so we have like each, the display controller register space is organized in such a way that all the resources are partitioned in 4K boundary. So we have this uh, support uh, in the hardware, I mean, to support the firewalling feature, which uh, the device manager can leverage to firewall specific register spaces from the other cores. So when you're partitioning, are you partitioning pieces of the window? Is that what you're doing? Or is there a way to overlay uh, uh, on top of each other? I see the overlay manager in the static one. So if I want some of my safety critical on top of maybe a video, it's in the mouse. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. So okay. this is this is a plane. This is one plane. You can Got assume it. it as one plane, and this is another plane. Both of them are submerged together with a background by this overlay manager, and okay. finally given an output. So if you do anything here in this plane, that's fully isolated. If you do anything with this plane, it's fully isolated. Both of them take input separately. Okay. And then there's, I guess, the overlay managers where you manage what sits on top. Yeah, of the you other can one. do. Bl yeah, you it's, you do blending. You can do transparency yeah. and all kind of stuff. It's like a video mixer. Like it will mix the okay. video pipeline pipe. and video light pipeline and. Okay. Kind of Uh, 
so using the IPC with the RP MSG, does that add latency or any other performance hit compared with just going straight from Linux out to the display? I think there might be some delays. Uh, we didn't prototype it because we had some hardware feature to leverage for this. So hardware was updated to you know support this kind of use cases. So we tried to leverage that with static partitioning scheme. But I would say IPC also has its own beauty and this also has its own uh, use cases. For example, if let's say you have some use case where the remote core uh, changes the resolution on the fly. Now, how do you communicate uh, it to the Linux? So that uh, we need again to define something for that, right? Even with what IPC mechanisms we had, uh, uh, we, we didn't have a good uh, handshake for these kind of dynamic changes. So this static partitioning scheme is uh, good for like uh, you have one core, it initializes it with the max resolution and you stay uh, with that resolution throughout. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I guess there is a complete boot video. If you want to see, we can show it like so. So this is uh, the RDoS that does the splash and immediately keeps the display up with tail tails being rendered. And in the background, Linux did boot and just launched another plane. Yeah, is there any um, mechanism to um, sync? frames, uh, if there's any sort of requirements around that. Sync frames with respect to... Right, so if you, if you have two different pipelines, is there a mechanism to sync the frames if, if uh, someone has a, that requirement? So, 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 if, uh, so that's what the beauty of this overlay manager that we have in the display controller. You, and we have separate register spaces where the duplicate status are already present. Okay. So if, if I say one pipeline has done a frame done and it's been out, the same status can be seen by the other host also in a different register space. Okay. So, so the, both the hosts are here knowing at the same time when I am doing a frame done. So you have no latency, you have the same FPS that you can have achieve. So there are dedicated interrupts to each host and the hardware supports asynchronous updates from different host and with, uh, I mean, it guarantees the frame done uh, happens. I mean, the interrupts are triggered at the same time. So th that's... Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi. Is this available on the TDA 4AP family? It's a similar display controller. This one is a 62P, uh, which has a DSS. Uh, I mean, similar DSS, not exact, but similar DSS. So the solution can be leveraged on all the TI, K3 based TI uh, devices, including what you said, the TDA4. Okay. And Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think uh, TDA family, Jacinto family has even more common regions so that you can support even more processors, uh, more than two processors also. I can leverage uh, multi-pipeline, multi-output scenarios with respect to that. Like four, four hosts can keep on controlling parallelly four displays, uh, three displays, two displays, like that.
So presumably the our, a real time operating system is not supposed to crash, but uh, if it does crash, will it still display what was last shown or will it uh, go to nothing? Because uh, like when I saw the Linux crash, the whatever was shown last stays up there and I don't want to give my user a false something. I'd rather an error message show up. So, so, so we, we do have uh, uh, specific features with respect to the TI display controller, like detecting freeze frame and data integrity check. So, and as I said, like these IRQ lines are duplicated and present to each of the host. So any MCU core that is running in a safety context can also subscribe to this IRQ and do safety monitoring. It can keep on getting those interrupts of when freeze happened or when uh, you have a data integrity failure of the frame. And it can do some diagnostics and do a blanking of the display, restart the display, uh, save the context, all can be done. I think we are done we are, with the time. Yeah. And if no further questions, then we can close. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.